All right, I don't know if you uh, paid attention to the news this morning, but I woke up and heard that Israel was once again under attack and hundreds of missiles, and I just think it's wonderful to see that the United States and other individuals and other countries rallied around Israel and shot down hundreds of missiles and drones uh, last night, and it seems like there's no fatalities that may change during the day, but isn't that amazing? And they talk about the might of the United States of America in thwarting this attack, but you know what? I also think that when we do that, we just don't give credence to God and His blessings of protecting Israel and His people. Because the Bible says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That doesn't mean we want negative things to happen to those that are against Israel. We want to pray for them too, but for 45 years, that regime has been chanting death to the United States, death to Israel. They serve a different God than we serve, and we should pray for them as well. Don't forget to pray for your enemies as well. Amen? A hey, big weekend for us. I appreciate all the people asked me this weekend about Caleb. Caleb is, uh, for you Texas Longhorn fans, this is a good time for you just to doze off for a second. But uh, he got his ring. He got his ring at Texas A&M. He's an Aggie, and uh, that's a big deal. And what made it even more special, he asked my father to put on his ring. So when we did the ring ceremony, you get somebody special in your life, and I think my dad has poured into him uh, as, a, as a young man spiritually and emotionally, and he asked my father to put on the ring. It was such a big deal that people stopped to watch what was going on. It actually went on uh, Texas a and social media page. So Caleb, as you know, is part of the cadets. They march, but he is also part of the RVs, and he has a command position. He just uh, was given for next year, so he'll be marching with the RVs as well. So thank you for your prayers. And if you remember when I first started here, he was um, in his freshman year and he was battling mono. And we didn't know if we were gonna have to take him out of school and we just relied on God. He relied on God and he just kept praying and he made it through and God has just blessed him. So thank you so much for your prayers and just wanted to give you that update. Uh, let's, let's begin with a little bit of a review from last week. We're in the book of Philippians, and we've been studying it, and we've been slowly going through chapter 1, and we're going to slowly go through part of chapter 1 today, a little bit later in verse 27. But if you remember last week, I asked you a question, because we are all told to be ready to give an account of Jesus Christ. And I asked you a question, and the question was this, how would you describe Jesus to someone? If someone sees the joy in your life, sees the peace that you have in your life, how would you describe Jesus to someone? I've seen people have trouble describing Jesus for a couple reasons. One, they don't know Jesus. Or number two, just because Jesus is everything, He's the great I Am in many ways, and you think, how do I describe that? So we broke it down into two, two basic verses that I thought gives a pretty good explanation of Jesus. Not a total explanation, but what was in Mark where it said, He came to serve and not to be served. So we find by that scripture that this individual, this God who could have considered himself equal to God, humbled himself and came in the form of a servant and served us mere mortal, mortals through his death, burial, and resurrection. So he's the ultimate service, he, servant. He's the greatest servant that has ever existed. Then we flipped over to the end of the Bible, to Revelation, where it says that he's the lamb and he defeats those that comes against him. Why? Because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So we see that also, in addition to being the greatest servant, he is the greatest king that's ever been. You break that down even further and you realize that you have an individual that has a humble spirit, but bold, willing to stand firm for the things he believed in. And we discussed how Paul's life emulated Jesus, how he was a servant to others. He put off wealth for himself, status for himself in the hierarchy of the Pharisees, but he put that off to serve other people and to serve Jesus. He was a humble servant, and he was bold because he preached Christ and he taught Christ when the world was hostile towards Christians. Living by the words he wrote in Chapter 1, Philippians, verse 21, Paul gives us an understanding of where his service and his boldness comes from. Because if you remember, when we looked at verse 21, he said to live is Christ, which means when he lives, he gets to serve Christ. He gets to lead people to Christ. Is there anything better we can do in life? No. There's nothing more important in our lives than to live a life 
to speak the truth and to share Jesus with other individuals. That's an ultimate servant. That's the ultimate servant. And so we see that in Paul, but then he says to die is the gain, meaning that no matter what the world throws at him, what type of suffering and adversity that he faces, he can still have joy in all of that. Because why? Because when he dies, he gets to be with Jesus. It's a beautiful way to look at life. Matter of fact, when we had that sermon, I talked about maybe we need to put that on, our, on a sign and have it as we go out into the world each and every day that we can read those words to remember what our responsibility is if we call ourselves a Christian, a Christ follower. Let's go back to Philippians 1, verse 27. We studied this last week. We studied really the first part we spent a lot of time on. I'm going to spend some time on the second part today, but let me, let me reread this for you. Verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, remember, we talked about this, that manner, some of your translations will have conduct. That tells us a lot, but it really doesn't give us the full meaning of the Greek word behind it. Because the Greek word is basically saying, you are a citizen of heaven, act like it. You're a citizen of heaven, act like it. Because the Greek word means you're a citizen totally committed to the cause. You're totally committed to the cause of Christ. This means that you can't say, I go to church on Sunday once in a while, I go to church on Wednesday once in a while, and I do whatever else I want to do other days of the week. It means you're totally committed seven days a week to Jesus Christ. It's part of your life. It's who you are. So you have to be focused on Jesus. And, and what's ironic, I just want to put, put this in here because I talked about this last week, I think it's important. Historically, remember, Philippi is a place where retired military personnel were located. They believed in Rome. They believed that the emperor was God. For someone to come along and say that their citizenship greater than citizenship in Rome was heresy to them. You could be put to death because of that. So what Paul is saying is not only let your manner and conduct, he's saying your manner and conduct could get you killed, but stand firm anyway, because that's what God has called you to do. Let's go on in verse 27. So that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. We're going to come back to that in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Let's look at standing firm. I, I want this to be our focus today. The reason being is we live in this great country with enormous wealth and with enormous power, as we saw last night. And we are not troubled as Christians like those in the Philippian church were. We do not have the onslaught where we have to worry about death. But I will tell you, things have changed rapidly in our country, and now Christians are being outwardly challenged, called different things, and Christians are falling back because they're afraid of stepping out to the forefront. But what Paul is saying, as a citizen of heaven, you have a responsibility to stand firm, even if you're being politically challenged or culture is challenging you. It doesn't matter what the world is doing. What matters is how you respond to it. And you respond to it by living a Christian life, speaking the truth, and standing firm no matter what the cost. The Philippians had to worry about death. We may have to worry about losing a job. We may have to worry about some other issue happening or not being invited to a social gathering. That seems like a small consequence for what Jesus did for us, especially if we're supposed to emulate Jesus. And as we saw last week, not only do we emulate Jesus, we are called at times to suffer for Jesus because it demonstrates the love that he had for us, that we have that love for others. So we need to stand firm. Now, I want to talk about standing firm for a moment because we talk about a lot of different things in, our, in the Scriptures, and we have read Ephesians in the past, and we have studied part of Ephesians in the past, but if you want to stand firm, that is a conscious decision that you make as an individual. I make a decision to stand firm. If you're an athlete and you're going to compete in the Olympics, you have to stand firm in your training in what you eat. If you're a boxer, you have to stand firm in your training. You have to be prepared because when the fight occurs, 
or the competition occurs, it's going to be evident who's trained and who hasn't. For a Christian, you are supposed to stand firm. And what are the things you're supposed to do to get ready? Ephesians gives us the answer in Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. I, won't, I was just going to read part of this, but I want to read all of it. And there's a, there's a specific reason. It says this, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. It's going to describe the whole armor of God in a moment. I want you to listen to this next part of this sentence. That you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Just as Paul is saying in Philippians, standing firm. Now, something I want to point out. We, we overlook this part. We talked about suffering last week. We talked about we have to suffer for the cause of Christ at times, which is against some of the biblical teaching that you hear today, which is erroneous when you study the Scripture. It's a, it's a privilege to serve for God. It's a privilege when someone comes against us that we can stand firm. But here's what I want to point out. Ephesians says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to withstand the evil day. The question is not if you're going to have evil come against you. The question is, when is it going to come against you? And the only real question that needs to be asked, are you going to be able to withstand it with the whole armor of God? Or are you not going to be able to withstand it because you did not have the whole armor of God? That's important for us to understand. We will face difficulties in this life. The only way we will get through it is if we have on the armor of God and we rely on Jesus Christ. 14. Stand firm, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Keep alert. If you are serious about standing firm for Jesus, then I would ask you this week to read Ephesians. To read Ephesians 6, 13-8. And maybe you break it down throughout the week and you say, I'm going to read about the armor of God and then I want to study the belt of truth. What does that mean? Plenty of scriptures. If you take each one of these parts of Ephesians 6 and you break it down and study it and you commit it to memory, you commit it to your heart, you practice it, you will be ready to withstand anything Satan throws at you. Why do I believe that? Because that's what my Bible tells me, and I believe the Word of God. Is it easy? Absolutely not. Does that make suffering any less emotional? Absolutely not. But it makes it bearable enough because you know you'll come out the other side. The beauty of suffering, I can't believe I'm using that term, the beauty of suffering, as we found out in Romans chapter 5, is that suffering, if we endure it, it builds our godly character. We know that. I am grateful as hard as it for me to believe now, especially when I was going through it, I am grateful for those challenges I've had in my life, and I'm grateful that I had a wife and family that supported me, and I was able to endure it. Not anything that I did wrong, some that I did do wrong. God can use that for good as well. But those things where I was standing firm, trying to do the best I can, everything for Christ, and yet people come against me. But when I endured it and realized how God was building my character, the second time I had to deal with an issue wasn't as bad as the first time. If you want to do great things for God, you've got to start by overcoming those small things in your life then God can build you up and build your character. And when you have that type of godly character that we're being asked to have in Ephesians, when we take that upon our life, we have a hope that the world just doesn't understand. We have a hope that the world can understand without Jesus. Matter of fact, we have a hope at that point that most Christians don't understand because they refuse to take on the armor of God because they refuse to suffer or they refuse to deny themselves for the glory of God. That's what we're talking about this morning, standing firm, the whole armor of God.
But there's plenty of other verses in the scripture that talk about standing firm. One in particular I want to share that I think is important is uh, from another apostle of Jesus Christ, Peter. And Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, says this. Remember, our focus is standing firm. It says, resist him. Resist who? Resist Satan. Resist evil. Resist sin. How do we do it? Firm in your faith. That's that armor of God. Knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. I have heard people say, I can't believe this is happening to me. Why can't you believe it? Because the Bible tells you that there'll be an evil day. And you're not the only one going through it. Other people have gone through it before you. And for those that have been through a difficult time, when you see another Christian going through a difficult time, it's your responsibility to serve them, mentor them, and offer them hope through that darkest hour. It's our responsibility as a church as well. So resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. That means all Christians are going to taste the suffering in some part of their life of spiritual suffering. And I want to point out that when you talk about resist, resist, it's a, it's a Greek term is what this translation from. It literally means to stand against, face to face with evil. You're going to resist it. It's like this epic battle between good and evil. Resist it. The beauty is the world thinks that that's like an equal battle. But if you put on the whole armor of God, it's not an equal battle. There's nothing more powerful than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you enter that battle, as Paul says, to live as Christ, I get to serve, to die is the gain. If there's a purpose in dying for the cause of Christ, that is a gain as well. Because Christ is going to be manifested because of all that you've done in your life. It's a wonderful promise to have. There's no one in this world that can have a promise that they're going to be successful 100% of the time if they do this. And I'm telling you, you'll be successful 100% of the time if you follow Jesus, not because everybody's going to listen to you, not because you're going to win every battle, but because you've been obedient to God. There's a purpose in all that. That's how great God is. There's a purpose in serving Him. Remember, Paul and Peter, they're telling us we're Christians. We are to stand firm and boldly for Christ. Not haphazardly. Not haphazardly. There is an enemy that is actively opposing us in this world. And we need to be ready. And the only way you defeat an active enemy is to be prepared. And how are we prepared? by putting on the whole armor of God. And why do we put on the whole armor of God? Not because we're narcissists and we're worried about ourselves. We put on the whole armor of God out of a spirit of gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. That's why we put on the spirit of God. As a Christ follower, I want you to think about that term. When you call yourself a Christian, you are a follower of Christ. You are a Christ follower. And if you are a Christ follower, you are called to stand firm and to serve others no matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. Let's look at another verse. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Now, Political correctness in verses like this, people will say, oh, this omits women, the, uh, the Bible's misogynistic. The reality is, is when you go back and you look Greek, this is about mankind. This is everyone. This is for everyone. It's not just for men. Ladies, it's for you too. It's for everyone. What it's saying is that all Christians should act in a courageous way. All Christians should act in a courageous way. Once again, Paul is calling us to be strong in our faith no matter what the cost. But there are some challenges to godly living that Paul brings up here. And I want to focus on those. First, he talks at the very beginning, be watchful. Be watchful. Now, here's what I hear 
as I'm traveling around, I'm talking to people and people I've known for years. We, we may even say it at the church. I'm not trying to get anybody's case, but I just want to explain why this is wrong. Be watchful. Why do we need to be watchful? We need to be watchful for an enemy coming towards us. We also need to be watchful about what's going on in society and then searching the scriptures for the answer to those challenges, right? That's our responsibility. Be watchful doesn't mean you put your head in the sand and not watch the news. Be watchful doesn't mean you don't listen to what's happening culturally. Because if you don't know what's happening culturally, how in the world do you give your children and your grandchildren the advice they need to navigate this world if you don't know what's going on? It's your responsibility to be watchful. If you see the enemy is doing something spiritually or active, learn more about it so you can go to the scriptures and refute it and teach that to your children and grandchildren. If they're not going to hear it from you, they're not going to hear it from the world. Don't put your head in the sand. When we start worrying about our own comfort, when we start looking inwardly at our church and only worried about our own comfort and riding out the storm, the storm's going to continue to grow because evil never dies unless Christians step in. That's why it says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. It's not about those not serving God. It's about us serving God. When we as a church forget to go outside the walls and serve, forget to go outside the walls and stand firm, and we're looking inwardly, that's a sign of a dying church. And I will tell you, as an individual, if I keep my head in the sand, and I'm not looking outwardly, and I'm not looking out for my family and my friends that I love, that's a family that's going to die. And we have seen that happen at record numbers across the United States. It's sad. Because we as Christians refuse to be watchful. We refuse, when we see evil, to stand firm. We refuse to be strong and act courageous because we want to live a life without suffering, without adversity. And that's not what God's called us to do. I'm not saying you have to be obnoxious. I'm not saying that you take up arms and have a revolt. What I'm saying is you demonstrate the love of Jesus through serving others. You demonstrate the love of Jesus by standing firm according to the Word of God and articulating a message just as Paul did when he would go to areas that he was not welcomed in or not really wanted. He would still stand firm and preach the gospel of Christ. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be courageous for Jesus? All of these verses we've gone through today really is pointing to us as a church and as individuals to live a life of conviction for Christ. Convictional living for Christ. Philippians 4, 1. Later in Philippians, we'll probably go over this again, but once again, Paul reiterates the standing firm. He says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Many scholars will say that when you read this, you can tell that out of all the churches that Paul dealt with, the Philippian church was his favorite. And you can, that's speculation. You can be a judge. But one thing's for certain, he loved the Philippian church. They were doing a lot of things right. And he wanted to encourage them. Because no matter where you are as a church, no matter where you are as an individual, there's still more work to be done because we're imperfect. We're always striving for that goal. And remember what I say, if we're not striving for a new goal and we're coasting through life, you can't coast through life as a church and you can't coast, coast through your own life in comfort without going downhill. I want you to remember that. To go uphill, to serve God, it's a struggle sometimes. It's a struggle. But boy, when you get to that pinnacle, what a view. What a view that God gives us. And that's where I think Paul is with them. He is thrilled with where they are as a church, but he also reminds them, no matter how good things are, stand firm in the Lord. No matter how bad things are, stand firm in the Lord. And he calls them my beloved. It's a command of love and affection. When, when God gives us these words, we, we want to focus on the things that could be negative for our well-being. But what he's doing is giving us a command that brings us closer to him. It's a command of love and affection. And Back to what it said earlier in Ephesians, when the evil one comes, it allows us to resist this evil and overcome it and demonstrate to those that are watching our life that that is truly a Christian. 
What did the Roman soldier say? Truly, this was the Son of God when he saw what he did. Made people look at us and say, truly, this is a child of Jesus. Truly, this is a Christian. No matter what we face. And sometimes they may not say that to you, but they'll recognize it by your actions, by your strength, by the joy that you bring. I I used to be around a guy, Southern Baptist guy that I worked with, and he was so negative. Everything he said was negative. How can you call yourself a Christian and be negative? When you really believe that to live is Christ and to die is the gain, what do I have to worry about? I'm here, uh, say I'm here for a hundred years. That's a speck of time compared to eternity. Speck of time. Our strength comes from one source. It comes from Jesus. Here's the importance of serving Jesus for your life. You can stand firm. You know God's there with you. It's why he's called you to do. You're in his will. But if you want to do good things in your life, if you want to, to raise a family that's a Christian family, if you want to ensure your grandchildren are Christian, we need to listen to the words of Jesus. We need to listen closely to the words of Jesus and John because Jesus tells us in his words that living with him will be fruitful. Without him will be death. Let me read what Jesus says in John 15, beginning in verse 4. He says, abide in me. How do you abide in him? Putting on everything that it says. The armor of God, it says in Ephesians. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's humbling, isn't it? Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing on your own. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and in my words in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. See, when I, when I read this, and we're doing this deep Bible study in our church here and on Wednesday nights and in our Sunday school classes. As we read this, God is calling us to a deep relationship with Him. We're supposed to have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ to guide our thoughts. Early in my tenure here at the church, I did a sermon about what's the first thought you have when your feet hit the floor in the morning? And the reality is the first thought that we should have is, thank you, Jesus, or Jesus, what do you have for me today? Amen? Thank you, Jesus, or what do you have for me today? That's convictional living. And then you're living that life. You're denying yourself. As we talked about suffering last week, you deny yourself. You choose to enter the world because you're watchful. And you see what's going on, and you say, I don't care what my neighbors think. I don't care what others think. I care about what Jesus thinks, and I'm going to stand firm and let my voice be heard before they try to take your voice away. That's standing firm for Jesus. We see this time and time again, and the beauty is we live in such a blessed country that we have the right to go anywhere we want and speak the truth about God. Regardless of the consequences, you still have that right. The reason we don't do it is we think comfort is more important than serving God. But as we just found out from Jesus, all those works you do without Jesus will burn away. But when you do them for Jesus and in His will, it has eternal blessed consequences. I want to go back to Philippians 1 verse 27 one more time. It talks about standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul is speaking to the church. It's almost like he's speaking to us here at FBC to stand firm in one spirit, in one mind, side by side for the faith of the gospel. We we see a visual of this every Sunday when we hold hands and we sing Family of God and 
we talk about the blessings that God's given us, and Ray has done a good job of, of bringing us together in that moment. And that's a wonderful moment. We get to see each other. We get to share Jesus with each other. We get to thank Him for what He's done for us. But the reality is, do we take that type of unity that we see visually, do we take that unity of the church into our Bible studies? Do we take that unity of the church into our public gatherings? Do we take that unity of the church into the city of Alice and beyond? Because if we're not doing that, and we're inwardly focused, we're dying. When we're outreaching, we're living. That's why our responsibility as a church, and I've said it time and time again, and as long as I'm here, I'll continue to say it, is to serve others. Why? Because Jesus came to serve, not to be served. It is to study and teach the Scriptures. Why? Study to show thyself approved. It is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus gave that commandment to us before he, the great commandment before he left to go to heaven. So those are three things that we are all called to do. We all have individual gifts and we all have individual callings at times, but those are three things that we can do as a church. And if we're serious about standing firm, we'll serve others. Let me, let me explain how this works. We serve others. We study scripture so we can teach scriptures. We lead others to Christ. And the Bible tells us that when you lead someone to Christ, you baptize them, and then you mentor them in the ways of God, which is almost like a circle. We go right back to serving them, studying scriptures with them, teaching them. Then we go out together and lead other people to Christ. And then we bring them back in because we're serving them and we're studying scriptures. You want to change the culture? Go out and preach Jesus Christ. Go out and preach Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the deacons and wives to come forward at this time. Why do we have deacons and wives to come forward? Because it tells us to pray for one another. The Bible also tells us if any sick among you, come forward, be anointed with oil, and be prayed for. There's nothing wrong with that because it's in the Scriptures. That's why we bring men and women forward. There have been times we've had no one come to the altar. There have been times we've had ten people at the altar. Probably the altar really should be full every Sunday for the needs that we have if we're serious about God. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us, Lord, with your knowledge. Heavenly Father, we are weak at times, and, and with everyone in this room, Lord, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short, but thank you for sending your Son to die for our sins. And Lord, I ask you now to convict us of those sins in our life. Help us stand firm. Let us put on the armor of God. Let us be watchful, Heavenly Father. Let us be courageous for what is right in a world that desperately, desperately needs Jesus. We thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you for First Baptist Church. We thank you for those in our 100-year history that has gotten us to this point, Lord. And we, we ask you to bless us in the future, to stand firm for you, no matter the cost and the consequences. Lord, I pray for those that you may be convicting with the Holy Spirit that need to know your Son. I pray for those of us that are just looking for direction or forgiveness, whatever our need is, Lord, you have said, come boldly to the throne of God. And that's this time now, Lord. And I pray that your work would be done, that you will talk to our hearts and that we, more importantly, Heavenly Father, will listen. In Jesus' name, I pray and give thanks. Amen.